Hey, Wayne Williams speaking of horses. Welcome. Hey, we are at Frisians of Majesty, a beautiful farm in Townsend, Vermont. And I've worked many times with Frisians of Majesty. Uh, beautiful horses, beautiful setting. And we're here to show you some of the festivities or activities that go on here. We're here during a high school girls one week camp at Frisians of Majesty. They, they get riding lessons, that's going on behind us right now. They get driving lessons, dressage lessons. They have cookouts and activities and uh, sharing some of the chores and really spend a week enjoying what the horses and this horse camp are all about here in the beautiful mountain settings of southern Vermont. So we're glad to have you join us. Let's go take a look at what all happens here at Frisians of Majesty. You're with us on Speaking of Horses. Ah, the magnificent Frisian horse, originating in the province of Friesland in the north of the Netherlands. Near extinct by the end of World War I, the Frisian horse is known for its grace, its beauty, its fluid movements, and majesty. Always black, always bold, and always beautiful. Join us on a visit to Frisians of Majesty, a beautiful facility in Vermont, right here. On Speaking of Hey, Speaking of Horses TV, Wayne Williams, we're here with Robert Labrie. Now, we're in Frisians of Majesty's Barn, one of the barns, here in uh, beautiful Vermont. So, welcome, uh, Robert, and tell us a little bit about how you got from a different career to this Frisian career. Well, when I was a young lad, six years old, on my grandfather's dairy farm in Massachusetts, he already had uh, 125 head of Holstein that he milked, and he always had four or five horses on the farm. And I loved being with the horses, and I hated milking cows. <laughs> so I got to take care of the horses. And I can remember sitting on my grandfather's lap at six years old, him teaching me how to drive a sleigh going through the fresh snow in the field. And I loved that. And I fell in love with that. And when I was in high school, my grandfather died suddenly of a heart attack. My uncle took over the farm, and he sold all the horses. So I went a long time with no horses in my life. And I got married in college, and so struggling with a, getting through school and being married. And then a year after that, we started having children, and uh, forgot all about horses. And I started a paving company, and an asphalt paving company, Paving Home Driveways. Got wrapped up in my business and growing that as a young, young man in my 20s. And then uh, when I was 49 years old, I sold the company. Uh, I had an asphalt plan, a rock quarry. I had 62 employees when I sold the company. And uh, was really missing horses in my life. And so I wanted to get back into horses again. So I took an early retirement and moved to Vermont. I had 350 acres I had bought here in 1984. And then in the year 2000, I bought these 300 acres here, giving me 650 acres here. Built my first barn and got three Frisians. That was my plan, I have three horses. And then I fell in love with this breed and started breeding them. And now we have 85 of them here. Wow. So I'm no longer retired. I just have a different career. Different career. Well, you know, we've worked together uh, many times at uh, like Horse World Expo in Harrisburg. And when you come in with your Frisians into an arena to put on performance for somebody, it's just fantastic. Well, thanks, Wayne. I enjoy doing those kinds of things. And uh, we do the... Uh, Harrisburg World Horse Expo is where you and I met, and uh, I do the Equine Affair in Columbus, Ohio, the Equine Affair in Massachusetts, uh, the, the uh, IFSHA World Champion Show in Lexington, Virginia. Th those are shows that we do every year that we exhibit at, and uh, I enjoy driving the horses and working with the people and doing the whole, yeah. the whole show. Now here at, here at your uh, Frisians of Majesty, here at your farm, uh, and we're going to show a lot of this as we progress, but you do uh, you know, bus tours, you do camps for girls and all those things, so there's a lot of activities for people to come here, 
see your facility and more importantly see your horses that's correct we have uh, uh, the bus shows we do about 65 shows a year from the first of May through October and uh, we do the women's camps once a month April through October and we do weddings with horse and carriage uh, I just bought a hearse we're starting to do funerals with the horse drawn hearse so uh, uh, we're big into breeding we have uh, uh, 20 really good quality top quality Frisian mares that we breed and this little four-year-old behind me here she uh, is the one we just flushed here today with embryo transfer she's doing really good in dressage so I want her babies but I don't want her to carry because I want to keep her dressage going because she's doing real good so that's why we did the embryo transfer with her this morning and the uh, the camps that we do here uh, I enjoy doing that I like working with the kids I like working with the ladies and we have our women's camps once a month and the breeding and the training for dressage and the training for driving we're really good at here you really are and what we're going to show you now is we're going to show you some of the many activities along with your breeding program uh, artificial insemination embryo transfer uh, the way they do the ultrasounds and everything that you do here that uh, is just amazing in the breeding program and also the quality of the horses in the ring show ring driving or, or dressage it's all here at, at your place and we really appreciate it well, uh, I hope you enjoy everything you're about to see, and uh, I've had fun working with you the last couple of days doing this, these things. Well, it's been a lot of fun, and Robert, we appreciate it. We're at Frisians of Majesty. It's right there on his shirt, and uh, we got a lot to show you, so watch, because this is interesting. You're with us right here on Speaking of Horses. the owner and operator of Frisians of Majesty in Townsend, Vermont. And we have a high school girls camp going on here right now, a week-long camp, and it's for girls between the ages of 12 and 18. And we have, uh, we take 12 girls at a time, and they stay right here on the premises with our uh, cottage and our loft apartment that we have. And my wife, Lori, does a great job of feeding them and taking care of them. And we're going to show you some of the activities that uh, we do during that week, whether it's riding and driving and breeding. And they can, you're going to see a lot of fun games going on and uh, sit back and relax and enjoy uh, what we're going to show you. And those we don't need. And that. That's okay. Put it away after. Um, so here's your here's your saddle. This is what your driving lines run through, and then running back to your bridging strap and your crouper strap. This right here is the bridging strap. This is how much basically space is allowed, but before the horse starts actually pulling, and then this part. Right here is the part that snugs underneath the tail. That's called the croup, the crouper strap. Now we don't hang this bridging over the back until after we tighten the saddle, because we don't want it to to pull this back, right? So we leave it there. We leave this up on his back, and then we tighten that girth nice and snug. Yep, really cool. Because he's pushing out there right now. Okay, put that in the keeper. Now that that's tight, we can take our bridging and bring this down, right? Bring it right to him. Good boy. So we always want to have a header when we're hitching. 
and tie back straps. This controls how tight or loose our bridging is. We want to have about, uh, we want this to be resting against his, his butt, but we want to be able to fit our hands inside of here, right? That's kind of our buffer zone. So, hitch to the ring right there. And then we'll know so now that it's snapped on both sides, it's against his butt, but I can fit my hand in here without it really squeezing down too hard on my hand. spend for Yeah, we're going to put those up. Yeah, it's a little short. <laughs> no. 
And we even had a brand new foal born. First thing that we have to do is to ultrasound her to make sure she has a CH, a corpus hemorrhagium, which produces progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. If there's no CH, no corpus hemorrhagium, then there's not going to be any progesterone and there won't be any pregnancy. We can't see the pregnancy because at this stage the embryo is only 250 microns in size. So therefore, we have to find it with a stereo microscope. So the stereo microscope is in the lab, and we're going to flush the embryo to a micron filter, and then take it into the lab and search the filter for the embryo. So first we have to make sure, by ultrasounding her, that she has a corpus hemorrhagic. And there we have a nice CH right there. That's a corpus hemorrhagium from the ovulation she had seven days ago. That's a really strong CH. That's a good one. So there is a good chance she's pregnant. Whether or not we're going to capture the embryo remains to be seen. And this mayor we have no experience with. We're doing a seven-day flush. This is her first time. She's never been flushed before. So she's a young gal, and she's four years old. Okay, the cervix is in place. The balloon is broken up, is blown up, and now we're going to put the flushing media into the uterus of the mare. Now we open up the red valve, and it's good gravity feed out of that bag hanging off of the ceiling. There's two liters in that bag. And we're going to put it in the uterus. We have three bags that you know you need to. Yeah. Is this the short one? No. All right. So what he's doing in there is this goes inside the vagina of the mare, and this gets pushed back into the cervix. So in the cervix, he will put in... It's going all the way through the cervix, all the way into the through uterus. the cervix. And then it gets plugged up with this air, which is the balloon catheter. You blow it up. And this... Inside of the uterus. Stopper. And that seals the cervix. So it doesn't sneak out. out. It's not going anywhere. So then when we're pulling the fluid in, it goes through here. And then at the end of it, we take the air out. And sometimes when you, unfortunately, when you blow up that balloon, if the embryo is close to the Pops. cervix, you're going to squeeze it against down. the uterus and you're not going to get it. He's not going to eat it. And she's just sitting there eating hay, paying no attention to what I'm doing back there. She's four years old and this is her first embryo flush. So you can see uh, how good she's being. And if you look back over 
the video of what you've seen so far, you can see the imprinting that we did on her when she was born is what allows us to have this good behavior at this stage of the game. What I'm doing right now is I'm, I just washed the cover off of the filter. Now I'm washing off the sides in case the embryo splashed onto the side of the filter and it got stuck up there. And there's a very, very fine micron screen inside of the filter. And I'm concentrating washing that micron screen out so that if the embryo is stuck on the screen, it'll go to the bottom of the filter dish. So when I put this under the stereo microscope, the embryo has to be in the bottom yeah. to be sometimes able to find, find it. it in five seconds, and sometimes it takes 20 minutes. Yell out hallelujah when you're <laughs> The word is bingo. <laughs> I'll be I put the washing media in the first bath. And then there's a, this is a protein solution that's going to feed the embryo. And I'm getting the donor mayor's bacteria off of the embryo. So there's a resi the, the surrogate mayor, so her body doesn't reject the foreign bacteria. Okay, so now I'm going to suck up that embryo that I've deposited in the first bath. And now I'm going to put it into the second bath. We're going to let it sit there for two minutes. Okay. Now we're going to go into the third bath, suck it up, have it in the straw, deposit it in the third bath for two minutes. So now I'm going to load the straw with the embryo in it into the embryo transfer gun. This is the trigger. I'm going to pull that out for now. Take the sleeve. Take this out. And now I'm going to load the straw with the embryo the into third. the gun. I'm lifting up with my thumb, depositing into the fourth. Now I'm going to load that into the into the straw, and I'm going to suck the fluid up until it hits that chemical. And then it's going to make a wad, very similar to the wad of a shotgun shell. And when, you, when the shell goes off, all the babies get pushed out by the wad out of the barrel of the shotgun. The same thing is going to happen here with this embryo. That plastic wad is going to push all the fluid and the embryo that I'm going to capture in the middle. So I'm going to put fluid, gap of air, fluid, gap of air, fluid, suck up the embryo, more fluid, gap of air, fluid, gap of air, fluid, and I time it. So now the fluid hits the chemical and hardens up. Then I won't, the baby won't fall out of the embryo, out of the straw. So now I'm going to load the straw. And I'm going to do a fluid and pull it out, get a little eighth inch gap of air. More fluid, gap of air, more fluid. Suck up the embryo. More fluid. Gap of air. More fluid. Gap of air. More fluid. And now I suck the fluid all the way until I'm hitting the end of the straw. Now I've got a fully loaded straw to put into the embryo now, transfer gun. I put the sleeve in. Put one pound of pressure on the straw. And that seats the nozzle at the end that seats the nozzle of the straw over that special nozzle there and now the gun is all loaded. 
Now I take the trigger, put it in through the hole in the center, and this is what's going to go against the plastic PVC. That's going to push it, everything out now. The gun is fully loaded, and I'm going to do just like insemination pipette, where you take insemination, and I'm going to go out to the surrogate mayor. They're scrubbing her up right now, and I'm going to go into the uterus with my hand, find the cervix, and I'm going to push this gun through the cervix up into the right horn of the uterus, and when I get it to the end, I'm going to pull back, come on down this end here, and I'm going to take the trigger, I'm going to slide the gun back here into the right horn of the uterus, that's what I'm going to do. So that's how you inseminate the mayor with the embryo. Well, that's our visit to speaking of horses and Frisians of majesty uh, while we're here for the camp. We're glad you joined us. Join us next time on Speaking of Horses as we take you on another adventure and we see you down the trail. Meanwhile, check out Frisians of majesty right here in southern Vermont. Ah, the magnificent Frisian horse, originating in the province of Friesland in the north of the Netherlands. Near extinct by the end of World War I, the Frisian horse is known for its grace, its beauty, its fluid movements, and majesty. Always black, always bold, and always beautiful.